Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our City Council meeting for June 15th, 2022. This meeting will also serve as our Finance Authority, our Housing Authority, and our Natural Gas Financing Authority. I'd like to call the meeting to order and ask our clerk to please read the roll. Thank you. Vice Mayor Haldeschelt? Here. Councilmember Alvord? Here. Councilmember Madonza? Here. Councilmember Ricucci? Here. And Mayor Bernasconi? Here. Thank you. Mayor we have Bernasconi, could I ask if there's a reason why our monitors aren't on here, Stephanie, in the control room? Ours are. Ours aren't. Okay. All right, looks like she's coming. Thank you. She's coming Thank forward. you, Mayor. Okay. We have um, the Brenningers here in the audience, and I am um, from Sun City and their community leaders, and I would like Thank to you. ask if Dave Brenninger would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. He put together a wonderful flag ceremony yesterday at Sun City, attended by hundreds of uh, residents, and we all learned a lot about the reiterations of our flag since 1776. As you rise, let me just say, on June 14, 1777, uh, the flag was really determined how it would begin to look, and the stars have been added ever since we've added states. So if you would, let's give a pledge of allegiance to a flag. Very few countries do this. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. very much. I'd like to ask our clerk if she would please review the meeting procedures for this evening. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the June 15th, 2022 City of Roseville City Council meeting. If you're present tonight and have not already picked up an agenda, they're available at the end of the staff table to your right. As a reminder, the Brown Act does prohibit the City Council from taking actions on items not listed on tonight's agenda. Speakers wishing to address the City Council may do so by stepping up to the podium. Each speaker will have three minutes, uh, during uh, which time comments can be made on non-agenda matters. The maximum allotted of time for this section is 25 minutes. Speakers that would also like to address uh, items on tonight's consent, I'm sorry, on tonight's uh, agenda will be given five minutes to express their comments to the City Council. Time will be monitored, and when the red light blinks at the podium, the speaker will be asked to please conclude their comments. Lastly, if you address the City Council tonight, please consider stating your name for the record. With that, thank you very much for your participation participation tonight. Thank you. We will move on to presentations this evening. I have one presentation to um, give a proclamation for Juneteenth, and I would like to ask Tuana Armstrong if she would meet me at the podium, please. Good evening. good evening. I had the pleasure of saying good morning to you also. We've yes. had a long days today. Uh, I would like to just share with you uh, a little bit about Juneteenth so we understand the importance for us. And if you will, uh, that's okay, I'd like to read part of this Absolutely. for you. Absolutely. So, uh, whereas President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation was issued January 1st, 1863, but the news of the end of slavery did not reach the frontier areas of the United States for over two and a half years. On June 19, 1865, Union soldiers led by Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas with the news that the Civil War had ended and the enslaved were free. African Americans who had been slaves in the Southwest celebrated June 19, commonly known as Juneteenth Independence Day. Juneteenth is a day of profound weight and power, a day in which we remember the moral stain and the terrible toll of slavery on our country. Juneteenth is also a day that reminds us of our incredible capacity to heal, hope, and emerge from the darkest moments, the darkest moments with purpose and resolve. On Juneteenth, we, we recommit ourselves to the work of equality, equity, and justice. And as we celebrate the centuries of struggle, courage, and hope that have brought us to this time of progress and possibility, the work that we, the work that has been done throughout our history as abolitionists, educators, civil rights, activists, public officials, and everyday Americans have helped make the real ideals and principles of our Declaration of Independence. So Juneteenth marks both the long, hard night of slavery and dis discrimination and the promise of a brighter future. So on behalf of um, the City Council, I would like to proclaim June 19th as Juneteenth and encourage all residents to mark their calendars and celebrate 
Juneteenth this month as we build a community of real, lasting justice and equality. Thank you for being here, and thank you for um, your work on this and always being so present in our community. Uh, thank Would you like you. to say a few words? I and I'll leave this for you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, esteemed Diaz. Um, and on behalf of everyone who does the work for this celebration, we appreciate your support. I would like to extend an invitation to each of you as well as the audience. We are going to be celebrating Juneteenth on Saturday at Johnson Spring View Park. It is a Placer County celebration. Please join us Saturday, 9 to 12, Johnson Spring View Park. We'll have a brief ceremony. We'll have some vendors out there. But it's definitely a, a, a time for everyone to come and uh, recognize our theme, which is a seat at the table for everyone. And we want to make sure that Placer County sh shows up Shouts out to the world that we do have a seat for everyone, everyone who shows up and wants to be a part of this great place in which we live. So thank you so much for the support, the ongoing support. Look forward to seeing all of you on Saturday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to public comment. Now is the time for anyone to address the council on any item that's not on the agenda. I do have one um, speaker card here who I can call first and then anyone can follow. We have um, Dave Brenninger under public comment. Would you like to come forward? Thank you again, Mayor, and good evening, everyone on the council and those who are also attending, those who are watching the video. I'm Dave Brenninger. With me, though, is my better half, Linda. We live in Sun City, Roseville, and we are just here as residents, but I think I could say, speaking for all 5,000 of our residents, to thank the council for your leadership and especially your uh, ability to stay the course on Measure B. Many of us were very active in our community, step up, step forward. Uh, to approve Measure B in order that you would have funds available to help the community with such things, additional police or fire or other staffing, uh, potentially a new fire station eight uh, near our community, uh, as well as just overall the great services you've done. I, I'm always mindful of the fact that when citizens step forward to approve a sales tax increase, they're investing even further and willingly in their community. In the same way, uh, Linda and I love to travel, perhaps you all do too, we are accustomed to paying a fairly sizable amount of a transient occupancy tax, or it's called the bed tax uh, in the vernacular. I understand Roseville's is, is quite nominal in comparison to what I'm used to paying elsewhere. Roseville, this city council, the staff, uh, Dom, and those before, uh, have done a great job in providing assets for our citizens and our visitors to enjoy this community. And so I think uh, as you might look forward to the uh, transient occupancy tax, keep in mind that's the other offset along with the commitment from your residents uh, to then have our visitors help uh, fund and pay for some of the amenities that are here. I know the uh, Placer Valley Visitors Group helps pay for some of the improvements, if not all, at the grounds. There's so many more things this city provides that people come here to enjoy. Uh, just would uh, want to also comment, we're really excited that uh, Sun City, and I know other parts of the community, uh, are seeing our streets improved. You may be well aware from having once walked when you elected at large Sun City, we have these gaping holes that at the time Del Webb built the streets, it was very wet and things didn't exactly stay as they should and they've moved around. Uh, your street department has been out uh, many times and we are now in the midst of a several year, five year plan to really improve the streets where appropriate. They've taken them out, laid new asphalt, and others, they found other technical ways to fill those gaps very, very well. So I just thank you for that, because that's really important for our community, and that's part of the image of what Sun City Roseville strives to be, kind of a, a key area for this city, just as you provide leadership for the entire community. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your comment. Is there anyone else here tonight that would like to make a public comment? Okay, we will I'll close public comment and move into the consent calendar and ask our clerk to please announce the procedures for approving the consent calendar.
Thank you. So tonight we do have items 7.1 through 7.42 for consent uh, calendar and your consideration. So all matters on consent calendar are considered routine in nature and will be passed by one motion. There will be no discussion on consent calendar items unless a member of the city council staff or a member of the public requests that a specific item be pulled for further discussion. At this time, neither council or staff has made such request. Is there any member of the public that would like to pull an item for further discussion tonight? Seeing none, uh, Mayor, we would like to move forward with adoption of item 7.1 through 7.42 on consent. If I may get a motion, please. So moved. Second. We have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Haldeschelt with a second by Council Member Mendonza. We'll do a roll call starting off with Vice Mayor Haldeschelt. Yes. Uh, Council Member Albert? Yes. Council Member Mendonza? Yes. And Council Member Rucucci? Yes. Mayor Bernasconi? Yes. Thank you. All items passed unanimously on a 5 to 0 vote. Okay, and we have three ordinances tonight. We will move into the first one, item 8.1, which is General Municipal Election, November 8th, 2022. And I believe we'll hear from our Assistant City Manager, Megan. Thank you, um, Mayor, uh, honorable council members, staff, and public. So tonight we have item number 8.1, which is our general municipal election that's being scheduled for November 8th, 2022. So this item comes to you tonight as a routine item, and it comes to you every two years on even-numbered years. So the city is currently scheduled to um, host its um, election on November 8th, 2022. And uh, this election is prescribed in our Charter Article 2, Section 2.02, and Charter Section 6.01 in compliance with California election laws. The City of Roseville completed its redistricting process in March of 2022. The process concluded with a new district map being adopted and the city boundaries being divided into the creation of five separate and new electoral council district seats. In 2020, the city held its first district election with three council members being elected at that time. This year, in 2022, the city needs to hold an election to fill the vacancy of two council member seats in Districts 2 and District 4, as their term will expire in November of 2022. <laughs> Voters in District 2 and 4 will have the opportunity to elect one member for City Council to fill a four-year term. Voters will also have the opportunity to vote on a transient occupancy tax or TOT hotel measure being considered tonight. The City Council... I'm sorry, let me see. Oh. I apologize. Um, the City Council will be able to um, consider that uh, next, and I'm going to um, have our Deputy City um, Manager move on with the next presentation of this uh, particular slide, an item 8.1. Yeah. So you're done with that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Did you want me to do that? No. I apologize. I think I skipped one here. Oh. Please accept my apologies. So um, the City Council will have the opportunity to have the nomination period open for this election um, on Monday, July 18th, uh, and it will open at 8 a.m. It will also close uh, Friday, August 12th, 2022 at 5 p.m. So during that period, all nomination uh, documents and election documents need to be obtained and filed with the Roseville City Clerk's Office. Appointments will be scheduled for distribution of nomination packets and forms will uh, be filed with the Roseville City Clerk's Office. Uh, with that, I'll move on and have our uh, Deputy City um, Manager um, do the next portion of this presentation. Great. Thank you, Carmen. I'm Megan Scheid, your Deputy City Manager, and I'm going to give some um, overview of the hotel and lodging tax measure, which will be on um, consideration tonight for the Council to place on the November ballot. 
Exploring this opportunity came by the staff looking at council strategic plan priorities. So remaining fiscally responsible in a changing world, maintaining a safe and healthy community, delivering exceptional city services, and investing in well-planned infrastructure and growth all requires revenue. And that is something that we set out um, back in 2016, taking a deeper look at this after the city spent years uh, cutting cutting benefit packages and salaries, looking at our staffing costs. We were looking at ways to save money. Um, and we were trying to do this all in the background before it became very visible to our public. And so once it became to a point where we needed to make cuts that the public was going to feel and see much more visibly, we engaged in a program uh, with the public to get their input called Engage Roseville. And what we learned from our community in several, many different formats, from surveys to public meetings to eight-month-long um, community priority advisory committee sessions was that the community would rather see us do what we can to preserve services. And with that, Measure B was something that um, was considered. So we were looking in 2016 at unfunded liabilities, um, significant underfunding of our CIPs. We didn't have any general fund or emergency reserves, and we had a lot of pent-up demands from the staff to keep things moving at a consistent level. Engage Roseville um, had us looking at those service reductions versus revenue increases, and we looked at a lot of different options at the time. We looked at a sales tax, a utility users tax, uh, the hotel tax that we're here to talk about tonight, and also evaluating our fees for services. And we took action um, on looking at our fees to make sure that they accurately covered the cost it costs the city to provide the services, and we also at this, that time recommended um, taking a look at the sales tax based on the input we got through Engage Roseville, and that's what the council decided to put on the ballots to let the voters decide in 2018 after that two-year engagement process. So that half-cent sales tax, um, as Mr. Brenninger mentioned during his public comment, that was a huge uh, win for the city because it really helped us sustain through the pandemic and it also helped us avoid significant service cuts. It helped us increase funding for all of our liabilities. We were able to create reserves, hire police officers, and support staff to maintain our service levels and to preserve our quality of life. When we started this journey, though, we were clear that Measure B wasn't the thing that was going to solve all of our problems forever. Rising costs, continuing pressures with that um, are all things that we have to deal with. And so Measure B is part of the plan, but it wasn't the plan in and of itself. The city has continued to consolidate where appropriate. We used technology to create efficiencies. We ramped up grant opportunities, um, created new business lines, and we've also kept up with co actual costs for service to ensure that growth in our community pays its own way. Growth pays for growth. And the next step is considering a transient occupancy tax, which is the legal word for a hotel tax on nights for overnight accommodations um, in hotels and lodging. And it's the next step that we're taking, um, asking the council to consider tonight to take a look at our fiscal plan and ensure we have the revenues to maintain our service levels now and into the future. So as we look at the focus of looking at a hotel tax option, one of the things that really resonates is paying fair share and asking our visitors to contribute to the services that they use when they're in our community. So there's a lot of things that we've done. We have an investment in sports tourism that has really ramped up in our community from the grounds. People have, you know, I, I know I personally have seen a lot of people I haven't seen in a long time who've come to our community for the first time ever because their kids have sports tournaments there. Maidu is a big host for softball games. We're looking at a long field sports complex in, in the west part of the city. Um, we have a lot of business and economic growth that's happened recently, uh, re really ramped up with the expansion of our healthcare system and technology and new businesses coming to Roseville, which all increase the demand for hotel stays. Um, and then demand on city services grows with that, with those overnight stays. Our visitors use our public safety services. They use our streets, they use our trails, our parks, our recreation facilities, and we're happy they're here and we're happy to welcome them here. 
And one of the ways they help fund for those services they use is through the transient occupancy tax, which is a hotel tax. Um, currently, Roseville has um, one of the lowest. It is tied for the lowest in the region at 6%. And uh, so that's what we're going to take a look at tonight. Comparatively, um, as we look at the transient occupancy tax, the hotel tax, the, we wanted to provide a scan of what the region, uh, where the region is at. And we're the lowest, as you can see on here, at 6%. 12% um, is where the city of Sacramento is, the county, uh, Citrus Heights, Elk Grove, and Rancho Cordova. 10% uh, is where Lincoln, uh, North Lake Tahoe is, plus they're located in a tourism business improvement district. There's an extra add-on there. Um, and 10 is also the statewide average. 8% is where Rockland, Placer County, Folsom, Auburn, Colfax, and Loomis are. And 6% is where we are at here in Roseville. A couple of very important things to note about the history of Roseville's hotel tax rate. Um, along with being the lowest in the region, we're also the ones that have been at that rate for the longest time. So it's, we've been at 6% since 1975. Um, the, it, it's remained unchanged. Our hotels have increased from four hotels in Roseville in 1975 to 19 today in 2022. So that actually very well reflects the increase in the, the uh, demand for hotel rooms in Roseville and the increase in services placed on our city staff. A ten, an increase from 6% to 10% would increase the average room night stay by $4.76 per night. That's based on the ADR of $119, according to Placer Valley Tourism's annual report. And it would also generate an, addition, an additional $2.7 to $3 million annually for the city. So... The staff would recommend that vote that city council gives voters the option to require overnight visitors to contribute more towards city services and amenities by increasing um, the hotel tax. So the vote tonight by the city council, just so the public understands what we're voting on, it, it in and of itself does not raise the TOT. That is up to the voters to decide. But the council is deciding whether to give voters that option by placing this on the ballot in November for voters, voters to consider. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our senior Deputy City Attorney, Jonathan Levi. Thank you, Megan. And good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Jonathan Levi. I'm a senior Deputy City Attorney in your City Attorney's Office. Uh, this slide is meant to represent a number of timelines that uh, kind of are required for the process for putting this measure on the ballot. Um, the next uh, trigger for us is the impartial analysis, which will be paired prepared by the city attorney's office. And then there'll be an opportunity for arguments in favor and against the measure, as well as rebuttal arguments from both of those positions with a 10 day examination period following each of those filings. And then the city clerk has on file the forms necessary for accomplishing uh, all of those different uh, milestones. Next slide, please. The uh, primary purpose for my participation tonight is really to provide a mile-high refresh to council and city staff on the topic of prohibited advocacy during the pendency of an election. And these rules largely are triggered and will apply as soon as and if uh, council approves the items before you this evening. So what we're talking about here, and this is probably a refresh from 2018, is really a, a shifting line in the sand where on one side you have informational and educational activity, which is allowed, and on the other side of that line you have advocacy, which is prohibited. Advocacy, unfortunately, is a bit of a moving target and eludes a bright line definition. I wish I could just say follow X and call it good, but that's unfortunately not the case for the majority of instances. For advocacy, it is largely a fact-based inquiry where we have to analyze elements like style, timing, and the tenor of the communication and look at whether or not it tends to compel or encourage a result, if it's inflammatory, uh, if it's emotion-stirring, or if it's argumentative. And I do want to highlight that the line does shift because even factual statements can run afoul and become advocacy based on these elements. 
The main seed that I want to plant this evening with council and with staff is that in the coming months, should you have any specific questions, concerns, or issues, that my office is always available to address those with you and for you. Next slide, please. So uh, part of this is knowing when these rules apply and advocacy prohibitions apply largely in four situational categories. The first, when we are speaking or acting in our official capacities or under the color of title, or when the audience reasonably believes that we're communicating from our official capacity. Uh, the second instance is that for uh, folks like our safety groups that wear uniforms, you are always prohibited from engaging in political activity in your city uniforms. And then third and fourth, our advocacy is prohibited on city time and in connection with city resources like money, our email systems, our social media channels, and our physical facilities. Uh, the, the one point that I want to kind of end this topic with to land this plane is that the consequences can be significant. Uh, they can uh, range from personal financial liability to prohibition on future office holding uh, all the way up to criminal consequences. Uh, and I say that more to encourage that if you have any questions to please make sure you reach out to us. Um, and when in doubt, reach out, which has to be sound legal advice because it rhymes. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. All right, finally, our recommendation from staff this evening is that you approve the items before you and declare the general election and submit this ballot measure to the voters. Please note that the motion for these actions should include a slight modification, <laughs> removing and omitting just the title portion of uh, that appears in these items where it says hotel and lodging uh, tax measure. That portion will be omitted and that's in with consultation uh, and direction from the county clerk. With that, if there are any general questions, we're happy to answer those. Uh, again, I encourage you to reach out if you have any specific questions. Um, and I turn it back over to council. Thank you, Jonathan, Megan, and Carmen. Um, does council have any questions of staff? I'll start on this end. Anything over here? No. Okay. Anything here? Um, I do have one question, Jonathan. When, are you able to define, you said, um, city slash official slash staff. Um, so specifically, where does council fall in that? Are we under the, offic the official category? Correct. You, okay. You are, when you're acting through your official category, this does not divest you of your individual personal political free speech. You just have to make sure that you are very cautious of the line when you are speaking from your official capacity with your mayor hat on that you do not engage in anything that comes close to advocacy. Outside of that, personally and individually, you still have your political free speech rights. Okay, great. Just want to clarify that. Okay, um, if the council doesn't have any questions of staff, I'll open it up to public comment. Is there anyone here this evening that would like to comment on this item? You can come forward now. Okay. I'll close public comment and bring it back to the council for any further deliberations, comments, you want or to take these in three separate motions. Or I'll ask our clerk what she'd like to do. We can do it all in one motion. Okay. okay. Are we ready for a motion? You had me at 1975. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. With that, the city council will consider adopting resolution number 22193, declaring a general municipal election, be held on Tuesday, November 8th, 2022, and requesting the Placer County Board of Supervisors consolidate the election with any other election consolidated on said date, and requesting election services to provide to be provided by the Placer County Clerk to fill two council city council vacancies in districts 2 and district 4 and to submit a transient, transient occupancy tax measure to the voters of the city of Roseville and also consider adopting resolution number 22194 submitting ballot measure text for the city of Roseville transient occupancy tax or TOT measure to the voters at the November 8th 2022 general municipal election and directing the city attorney to prepare an impartial analysis and directing the city clerk to establish requirements for filing primary arguments and rebuttal arguments regarding the city of Roseville's TOT measure and last 
um, also consider adopting an ordinance subject to voter approval directing amending the transient occupancy tax rate by amending section 4.24.030 of chapter 4.24 of title 4 of the Roseville Municipal Code regarding transient occupancy tax be placed on the November 8, 2022 general municipal election ballot and make an amendment to um, to each one of the resolutions 22193, resolution 22194, and the ordinance to omit and remove the hotel and lodging tax measure wording from each resolution and ordinance to be in compliance with California Election Code 9051. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Thank you. I have a motion on the floor by Council Member um, Alvord with a second by Vice Mayor Heldeschelt. With that, we'll do a roll call starting with Vice Mayor Heldeschelt. Yes. Uh, Council Member Alvord. Yes. Council Member Mendonza. Yes. Council Member Ricucci. Yes. And Mayor Bernasconi. Yes. Thank you. Item uh, passes 5 to 0 unanimously. Thank you for allowing us to move forward with our election. Yes. Thank you. And thanks for the information and the presentation. Okay, we'll move on to item 8.2, the Vernon Street substation expansion, property acquisition of 1415 Vernon Street and budget adjustment. Good evening. Good evening, Bernasconi and council members. Um, I'm Bill Chaplin with the Rose Electric Utility, and I oversee our key accounts and economic development efforts. As you may know, over the past couple of years, the utility has been partnering closely with economic development, and the item before you tonight is just a great example of what that partnership can really do. Um, Rob has a, a brief presentation, and after which we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Bill. Good evening, Mayor Bernasconi, members of the Council. Rob Klein, your Economic Development Project Manager. Uh, tonight, staff is recommending that City Council uh, adopt a resolution authorizing the City Manager to execute any and all documents related to the acquisition of 1415 Vernon Street for a purchase price not to exceed $500,000 and also to adopt, an, or to adopt an ordinance authorizing a budget adjustment in the amount of $500,000 from the electric fund to cover all costs associated with the acquisition of 1415 Vernon Street. <clears throat> Roseville is seeing infill development and growth occur within the downtown area. To better serve the customers of the area, Roseville Electric Utility anticipates the need for a future expansion of the Vernon Street substation. An expansion of the substation may include the addition of a second transformer, increasing capacity and reliability in the area serviced by this substation. The current substation site is not suitable for an expansion, and as a result, Roseville Electric has interest to acquire the parcel directly adjacent to the Vernon Street substation at 1415 Vernon Street. 1415 Vernon is uh, zoned light industrial. It's approximately 0.2 acres, which would double the current footprint of that substation site. Recently, it was discovered that 1415 Vernon was foreclosed on and is currently owned by its lender. <clears throat> the property was listed on the market for five days from June 1st through June 5th, 2022 for $325,500. Due to the tight deadlines, the listing agent's experience with foreclosures <clears throat> and the lender's procedure for accepting bids, the city retained uh, the listing agent, Paul Booty of Keller Williams Realty, for dual representation. On June 3rd, the city submitted a minimum offer of $325,500 for the property and as is condition. Now, I'd like to note that the $500,000 budget adjustment was in anticipation for the city to make any counter offers if needed and to cover any costs associated with the acquisition of the property. We estimate that the total cost of acquiring the property now to be approximately $340,000 to $350,000. And I'll provide a brief update uh, since the council communication was submitted on June 6th. On June 7th, the city was informed that our offer, which is contingent upon city council approval, uh, was approved uh, or accepted at $325,500. On June 8th, the city executed the offer acceptance documents. Next, the city would uh, wire $32,550 into an escrow account as our 10% earnest deposit. 
and with approval from city council this evening we would the city would execute the purchase and sale documents the lenders board would then meet for final approval and the close of escrow is currently scheduled to occur on June 24th, 2022. On summary, the acquisition of 1415 Vernon Street is critical. This would provide Roseville Electric Utility an opportunity for a future expansion to accommodate growth and better service the customers in the area. Following the purchase of the property, the city plans to demo the site and install fencing for security. And this re request would be brought back to council at a later date. So staff's recommendation before you tonight is listed here on the slide. Uh, this concludes the presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. So let's have Bill Chaplin with Roseville Electric and uh, Joe Mandel with the attorney's office who are happy to assist as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for the information. Uh, is there any questions of council? I have a question. Um, so this is the property with the greenhouse on it, I believe I drove by the other day. It, so you're going to raise it and fence it. Uh, when do you estimate you'll do that? And then also, when do you estimate you'll actually start developing, expanding? Uh, <clears throat> right now, we're currently think that the demolition and the security of the site would happen fairly quickly, just mainly for uh, liability purposes for to, the summer. to secure it, yeah. correct? Um, in terms of an actual expansion, um, right now we believe that's years out. Uh, fortunately, you know, that we, Roseville Electric has realized that an expansion would be needed for the substation. And due to the property being under foreclosure, this was an opportune time for the city to move ahead and acquire the site. And so that's why we're bringing this to council this evening. So it could be years before we actually expand, but at least we've got the property now. That's, that's correct. Okay. And, and I'd just like to make one thing clear as well, just because we, here we are talking about, you know, the potential of a future expansion um, and capacity and, and reliability that <clears throat> the substation in the downtown area does provide, obviously, very reliable uh, energy. But with the growth and development that we're seeing, uh, this is just a step to, to secure property for a future expansion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. This may be a Joe Mandel question. In foreclosure, you purchase the property as is? Correct. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. And I assume this is significantly under value. Um, I'm just making that presumption. Has there been any investigation on the site on any liability we might um, get uh, a take on with respect to the purchase of the property? <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> at this time, we haven't gone forward with any type of uh, analysis or, or um, inspections of the property, um, but that would be the next step, um, especially if we're to move forward with demolition, we would have some different inspections done. This is coming. I'll add a little bit more. Joe Mandel from the city attorney's office, just mm -hmm. to answer a little bit more of that. My understanding is we still don't have all of the finalized documents from the bank, and so I anticipate getting all of those tomorrow, and that technically starts a timeline of eight days for us to be able to go out and do inspections and whatnot as needed. But, yes, this is a foreclosed home. It's being purchased as is. Every offer had to have at least a minimum bid of 325500 as is. How quickly can you close escrow? you know, is it cash? Is it a loan? That sort of thing. So yeah, we will yeah. still be able to have an opportunity to go in and do inspections, but it's just a short period of time. So we may, there may be liability, but there also might be a cash of Bitcoin down there and that would be ours too, right? Sure. <laughs> I think if there is a cash, it just diminished recently. <laughs> a lot. Um, so I just asked the question, if I mean, the house doesn't look so great from the outside, but if it's a fairly reasonable structure, why not rent it out for a couple of years and use it as a revenue source? Figured I'd ask. That's what I'd do if I was a property owner. I, uh, Joe, I can take that. Can, I'll take that okay. one. Uh, Councilman, thank you. Uh, one, it's really not the business we're in. 
uh, as far as being a, being a landlord and a tenant. Uh, I, I think there'd be a fairly significant expense to that. It was always anticipated to, to buy, to expand, and demolish it as, as quickly as possible so it didn't become an attractive nuisance. Uh, we didn't anticipate that we would, we would take it and, and be a tenant. And, and so just a little more on, on this. Uh, it was always in our five-year plan, and, and the reason this was expedited was because of the foreclosure, uh, and that was the reason for the time, tight timeline. You, you also run into issues of if the property is currently unoccupied, and so in the future if the property is occupied, you think about if the government were to remove someone from an occupied property, there would be relocation damages and things like that that would be required. So this is an opportune time, again, for us to be able to acquire the property. Any other questions of council? I, I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity. How often does that happen right next to your facility? And um, uh, you know, price is right. And like you said, you're going to be doing the inspection coming up, and you'll see if this is really um, as as good as we hope it is. It sounds good, but you need to check that out. Uh, and um, we have we have good. Uh, utility service there right now but this plans for the future so I, this is a, this is a very good thing and it's good that both we have economic development and on our electric department working together and finding this okay and if the council doesn't have any other um, questions of staff I'll open up to public comment is there anyone here this evening that would like to speak to this item Okay, I will close public comment, bring it back to the council to see if there are any other um, questions before we take action. Okay, I think we're ready. Thank you. So the city council will consider adopting resolution number 22-200, authorizing the execution of any and all documents related to the acquisition of 1415 Vernon Street, and adopting ordinance number 6523, authorizing certain amendments to the fiscal year 2021-22 budget, and declaring the ordinance to be immediately effective as an appropriate measure. With that, may I get a motion, please? So moved. Thank you. I think you have a motion on the floor by uh, Council Member Rakuchi with a second by Council Member Alvord. We'll start off roll call with Vice Mayor Heldeschelt. Yes. Council Member Alvord. Yes. Council Member Mendonza. Yes. Council Member Rakuchi. And Mayor Bernasconi. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to um, our big one here this evening, or our extra big one, item 8.3, which is our. Our budget, our City of Roseville fiscal year 2022-23 citywide budget position allocation schedule, Roseville Housing Authority budget, and the Roseville Finance Authority budget. And we have our city manager this evening who will give us a presentation. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, and thank you. Uh, Council, as you mentioned, Dominic Casey, your city manager. I am pleased to be here tonight to preside uh, a few budget items, actually, not just our citywide budget. As soon as the presentation pops up, I will share it. Okay, and I'm not Scott Pettingill, our budget manager. He, he fell a little bit ill today, and so uh, you get me. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> so keep the, you sharp, so that, that's there right. you go. That's All right. right. Okay, so the agenda, next slide, please. Uh, on the agenda tonight, this evening, uh, we do have a condensed summary of our citywide budget, our housing authority budget, and our Roseville finance authority budget. And then at the end of each, each, or not really at the end of each one, but at the end of the presentation, I'll conclude with a recommendation to formally adopt all three of these budgets, which we've, as I will share, we've heard at length over the last several months. And I'd like to begin with the citywide budget. The budget was the result of extensive budget process This last uh, that began in February. The process included presentations on the budget development calendar, on city liabilities, on, capital, on our capital improvement program, our financial policies, department presentations, as well as the city council goals workshop and the budget hearings that occurred here on May 31st. And also included on this slide is an overview of the annual citywide budget process that highlights not only will this budget process not stop at adoption, but it continues to go on throughout the year with regular monitoring and updates and reviews, as well as planning for the future. And as always, we want to make sure our budget process is inclusive. It includes a focus on awareness and outreach. It included the development of our, our well, it's not really new. We've done a couple now, but our budget and brief document, which really takes the budget, breaks it down into bite-sized pieces so we can make it understandable. 
uh, and it makes the budget information also widely available to the public. So we share this on all of our social media platforms as well as all of our community meetings because the outreach to our, our community is important and something our city council values and as staff we recognize that and so we're ensure to get that out. Uh, and then finally our budget hearings where we included an overview of the budget uh, that were presented by each of our city departments. The proposed budget tonight supports the city's mission and goals in a fiscally responsible manner. It also serves and funded, <clears throat> excuse me, services funded in the proposed budget include fully staffing the police beat in West Roseville, uh, additional animal control staffing, and also a development of a real-time crime center, which we've been hearing a little bit about in our, in our police updates. It also expands our graffiti abatement program, and it invests in capital projects such as the Roseville Sports Complex, our renovation at Weber Park, and also Johnson Pool. It also supports business growth, and it looks to ways to help address homelessness in the community. Paying down our unfunded liabilities is also a priority, and making sure that we have an econom economic stabilization and emergency reserves, really taking, making sure that not only does this budget take care of today, but keeps an eye on the future. Oh, you, you got ahead of me. So we can stay there on the revenue types. <laughs> the citywide revenue budget total is $788 million. This pie chart breaks down the revenue by type of fund. The largest slide of, in this pie, the slice of this pie, is the city's enterprise funds, which includes Roseville Electric, the environmental utilities, which include water, wastewater, and solid waste, as well as Roseville Transit and Adventure Club program. These enterprise funds make up 56% of our city fund, citywide fund. The next largest slice of the budget fund type is the general fund, which consists of 28 of the city, or 28 percent of the city revenues. And this funds police, fire, parks, recreation, libraries, uh, as well as public works and, and parts of development services. And the remaining is uh, 16 percent, and this revenue consists of special districts, development fees, as well as our golf, golf course funds. Now, our citywide expenditure. On the next slide, there we go. Uh, citywide expenditure budget is $767 million. And the proportional share of each of the major spending category included in the proposed budget is very similar to what we've seen in prior years with, with minimal growth. Salaries, wages, and benefits, uh, as well as materials, services, and supplies do make up a majority of our spending plan. And salaries, wages, and benefits make up 35% of our budget uh, at $272 million, and the next largest spending category is materials, services, and supplies, which is 31% or $239 million, which is very typical of a ser service-oriented organization. 16% or $119 million of the proposed budget is dedicated for our capital projects, and 10% or $75 million will be spent on the electric of our purchase power and supply. The remaining 8% of the spending plan, as indicated in the other category, includes things like spending for debt service and transfer into our other funds. Next up is our staffing levels and our staffing allocations. You can see uh, this is for our citywide. We're recommending that we have an increase of 43 positions in the budget from 1,277 to 1,320. And this growth represents about a 3% increase in our overall staffing levels. Uh, the largest staffing increase are in police and parks and environmental utilities. And almost all, if not most, of these changes are directly related to, to growth increased services or a, a, a mandate from the federal or state government. Listed also is our five-year capital plan and the proposed budget is 105 million for this next fiscal year uh, with, with poor appropriations with the majority of the projects in parks, recreation, libraries, and the utility departments. These projects include road, roadway rehabilitation, funding for a regional sports complex, and Johnson Pool upgrades. Staff have also incorporated department's long-term capital planning over the five-year capital improvement program, which are included in this budget, with almost $400 million in capital spending over the next five years across the respective departments. Now I'd like to move on to the general fund. As you can see in the general fund, the total general fund operating revenue is almost $212 million. 
the pie graph shows the general fund revenue contributions from each source. With the Bradley Burns sales tax and Measure B sales tax and property tax revenue making up almost 80% of the general fund. The remaining 20% is made up of licenses, permits, the electric franchise free fee, and also charges for services and other, other taxes. And it's always nice to kind of see how that money is spent throughout the general fund. As you can tell from, from this chart, uh, is a little break away from your traditional pie chart, but really just breaks out how we, how we support the services in the general fund. Uh, large, largely support the police department is 26% of, of the overall budget which breaks down to about $55 million. Uh, the fire department is 20% of the budget, which is roughly $42 million. And then followed up by parks, recreation, and libraries, which makes up about 15% of the general fund, uh, which is $31 million. And then you see the balance of the fund is dedicated to general government, uh, as well as, as public works and, and portions of development services like code enforcement uh, that aren't funded directly through fees for service. Uh, the other categories include transfers to funds uh, and those CalPERS uh, discretionary payments we talk about when we're buying capacity into the future, making those one-time payments up front. Now next, I'll briefly cover the staff. The staff is proposing the annual citywide budget ordinances. Uh, there are two ordinances to consider, which are really uh, tied to making us more accurate and more efficient. And we're re recommending two changes. The first is section 3.16. This new section will authorize the city manager to increase revenue and appropriations for city council approved bond issuances. The second is section 3.17. This section will authorize the city manager to decrease revenue and expenditure budgets for development services for fully reimbursable development projects to match the actual amount of revenues that are received and expenditures that are incurred within a fiscal year. These items are both recommended to improve year-end financial reporting, aligning the budget with actuals, which will give us more accuracy at year-end, reflecting these services are fully funded and reimbursed by developers. And with these both... Both of these options, they, from the time they set, they do move, and they move within the quarter and within the year, and so it'll give us the ability to move them, to adjust them so they're accurate at the time of reporting. And now we're moving out of the, the citywide budget and general fund budget into to the one of two of the additional budgets we'll be looking at or approving this evening. Uh, and the first is moving on to the housing authority budget. The housing, the housing Authority budget includes funding to administer the Housing Choice Voucher Program, provides rental assistance to low-income, disabled, seniors and veterans that are in Roseville and Rockland. This ensures housing and e economic self-sufficiency for 795 houses. And it infuses almost $6.8 million into the, into the federal funds into the local economy each year. It's important to note that Housing Authority receives its, its funding from the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, otherwise known as HUD. The Housing Authority budget includes $6.8 million in federal HUD revenues to be spent on the rental assistance programs. And in terms of administrative revenues and expenditures, the budget includes $857,000. Uh, roughly $858,000 in funding from HUD and $104,000 for administration fees to cover uh, the City of Rockland and repayment agreements that also support program and administrative costs. The funding provides support for salaries, wages, and benefits, uh, totaling $659,000 and other operating costs totaling almost $198,000. The variance between the available administrative revenues and expenditures is approximately $82,000 and is funded by a contribution of the general fund, which we've been doing for the several, past several years. Uh, just for some perspective, uh, it was about $76,000 uh, last year, so modest growth this year with supporting the administrative costs. Now lastly, I'll provide a quick update for the Finance Authority. 
And just for a quick reminder, the Roseville Finance Authority is a separate legal entity that is established to provide financing for city capital improvement projects. And this fiscal year, the expense for the budget for the Roseville Finance Authority totals approximately uh, $3 million. And this budget includes $2.4 million for debt service payments that go to the corporation yard, which is a city uh, facility, uh, to the golf courses, both golf courses, as well as 316 Vernon Street, which are the uh, city offices and where Sierra College is across the street for repayment on, on the building. Uh, the budget also includes a $400,000 uh, repayment from the citywide park funds for the completion of Harry Crab Park. So as I mentioned earlier, there are three different uh, budgets here this evening that we'll be, be discussing and be, be taking action on. Uh, so it includes three recommendations. The first adoption of the ordinance approving the fiscal year 23 citywide budget, as well as out-of-state travel request, new vehicle requests, and citywide position allocation schedule. Additionally, the second resolution approving the Roseville House Housing Authority's budget for fiscal year 23. And the final resolution is approving the, the Roseville Finance Authority uh, budget for fiscal year 23 as well. I know this was very brief and, and it's mostly because I think you guys have probably heard the similar presentation 15 times over the last six months. So uh, I, I did try to keep it brief, but if you do have any questions, happy to stand for those. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to the mayor and council. Thank you for your presentation. I think that is really important to note is that um, we have been talking about this for at length and um, have had input from our community for months, input from staff, and so this is just really our final discussion and stamp that we'll move forward with it. So with that, um, do any of our council members have comments or questions of our city manager? Maybe just go ahead. I, I really appreciated that you made the, the small little booklets for the community because it really was precise. People could see it. I brought it to where I saw people and said, you know, look, it's really easy to understand, and it tells you what, how the city is, uh, city is um, using uh, city funds, and I think that's really good. I also appreciate the booklet that we originally got. It was very concise. It told you all the people that help participate and um, in different departments, and so you can see that this is not that you... You say it all the time that it's a whole group that's doing it, but it actually tells you who, who is doing it and who are who's um, on on council planning commission. It, it was, I I thought that was really uh, gave me a feeling of uh, really a completeness, and I was hoping that that would if I was a member of public and was looking at this, you could say, gee, a lot of people are working on on uh, our uh, our budget and and uh, plans for the for um, Roseville. So now I, I like your presentation. Thank you, Dominic. And um, uh, because uh, as our mayor said, we've we've gone over it in on a lot of different details on on different parts of it. But this put it all together. So uh, thank you. Yeah, and mayor, if I could just thank staff for you know the, their briefings, but I also. I think it's appropriate to recognize that, at least probably for a decade, um, that the city council, in partnership with our professional staff, has really been fiscally prudent and managed this city in, in a really, really pragmatic uh, a way. And that is reflected in where we are today. We don't know where we're going to be tomorrow. Um, but, you know, I think I want to recognize that I know Councilmember Alvern and Councilwoman Ricucci and, and others prior to any of us being up here um, were certainly keeping a, a keen eye on the city finances and doing it in partnership with our professional staff. So I just want to recognize folks. Thank you. I also think that it's important to point out that this is built upon a strategic plan. And everything in the budget points to um, our priorities as a city. Everything has to, to match the strategic plan. So you start with a plan and then you set your budget to it. And I appreciate that we work that way because that's how really good corporations work. And I think it says a lot for our city to be able to follow those kinds of standards and, and let the strategic plan lead the budget. So appreciate that. Yes, thank you. Good points. I would just like to say that, you know, this is probably one of the most important things that we do as a council. 
and I think that this, um, I think that we're all really proud of this budget, and I, it's a reflection of our priorities. It reflects our healthy financial position. It reflects our desire to be financially prudent um, and plan for our future. I mean, everything is covered in here, and uh, from our capital improvement projects, what we can do with housing, um, and as Pauline mentioned, you know, you, your staff really did an amazing job, whether it was the at a glance, it was the full, um, well, there were several different versions, depending on what um, uh, tolerance level you had for reading, but even the position changes um, spreadsheet. I think one of the things that I'm most excited about, and I think that my fellow um, council members are too, are the additions that we're making to our police department and the investment there. I mean, that is really huge for our community. And I will just share that, um, you know, I've, 20 years ago when I was on a school board and all the years I've served, it's not fun when you don't have a budget that looks like this and you're talking about letting people go or having to close schools or close programs, but we have heard from our residents that they do value the quality of services that they get. And so I, I'm really proud of the work that we've done together. And uh, unless anybody else has anything to add, I'd like to ask that we have a motion and we open for public. Oh, thank you. Yep. Most important, um, is there anyone here this evening that would like to speak to this item? I'll open it up for public comment. Oh, good. <laughs> good evening. I really just wanted to get up here and say hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> uh, name, rank, and serial number, correct? Yeah. yeah. Whatever you'd like to give us. Well, don't, my name, Muriel yes, Moore. Yes, thank uh, you. City of Roseville is where I live, okay? And this is to uh, City Manager Casey, yeah. The 2021-22 20, budget, okay, it would, to, to me, it would have been good to reflect, and if I can remember, and sometimes that's that all, always good, the present budget is $767 million. Is that about right? Yeah. Okay. And the general fund is 28% of that. Was that? From the general fund, it is... Can I answer? Yeah. Two yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the general fund is is roughly two hundred and twelve million versus the seven eighty eight is the citywide budget, which includes the utilities. Okay, I, I understand that. But of the seven hundred and sixty seven million, okay, of that budget, it's twenty eight percent. I thought twenty eight percent is what sticks out to me. I thought you said it was twenty eight percent of the. And maybe I'm wrong, okay. but my point, what I'm trying to get to, it would have been good to have the 21-22 budget, budget that was there so that you could see where the increases or decreases were in general fund or any of the other uh, allocations that were going out, especially to city employees like crossing guards, okay, where we fit in. Was it an increase or is it a decrease? That's what I'm trying to say. Am I making sense to you? Yes. You are you. making sense. Yes, thank you for your we comment. Go. I believe in other iterations that we've gone through over the last six months, we have had that information, but this is was not a was full a, presentation of the budget, but okay. thank you for your comment. I have another one. Let's, okay, okay let's Am I hear on it. the time limit? The other one was on the housing, the agreement with Ro uh, city of Rockland, okay, just a high, brief, what does that entail? What is that about? So this evening, it's just public comment. So go ahead, if you want to make your public comment, and then we can follow up with you and get your answers. Yes. Okay. I understand. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you for your comments. Is there anyone else here this evening that would like to uh, make a public comment on our budget on this item? Okay. I will... Um, close public comment and bring it back to the council for either further deliberations or if we're ready for a motion. You only have three minutes to make this motion. <laughs> Let's go. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, the City Council acting as the Board of Directors for the Roseville Housing Authority and for the Roseville Finance Authority will consider adopting resolution number 3-22, approving the annual budget for fiscal year 2022 through 2023, and consider adopting ordinance number 6522, adopting the annual budget for the fiscal year 2022 through 2023, adopting budget control policies, adopting an appropriations limit, adopting the budget for the successor 
agency of the uh, Roseville Redevelopment Agency and to be effective immediately as an urgency measure. And also consider adopting Roseville Finance Authority Resolution Number 2-22, adopting the annual budget for the fiscal year 2022 through 2023. May I get a motion to adopt, please? So moved. Second. <laughs> Thank you. There's a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Heldeschelt with a second by Council Member Rucucci. With that, we'll start roll call with Vice Mayor Heldeschelt. Yes. Council Member Elvard. Yes. Council Member Mendonza. Yes. Council Member Rucucci. Yes. And, and Mayor uh, Bernasconi. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. We have item 9.1, which is a public hearing. I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. It's the 2022 weed abatement. And we will hear from our fire division chief, Jason Rizzi. Yes, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. I'm Jason Rizzi with the fire department. I'm joined by Chelsea Zine, one of our fire inspectors, and also Eric Dexter from our park, recreation, and libraries department. The weed abatement program is just a lot more than just one department, so we wanted to give you just a brief presentation on what it entails before we uh, hold the public hearing to receive any objections per the government code. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chelsea. So every year we send out uh, letters to all of our vacant owner parcels to encourage them to abate their weeds or uh, put in fire breaks along their property. Um, each year, um, just kind of what that means is that a vacant parcel is an undeveloped parcel. It is not anything that has a home or building on it. All that falls under code enforcement. All those would be taken care of by code enforcement. Um, that's basically it for kind of my portion. Um, first, we have a great relationship with the fire department, so we work together in, in a lot of ways, and we handle these uh, fire issues in really three ways. We do it through our fire breaks with our contractors. Currently, they're working six days a week. They're right at it. And then we do it with our internal team that takes care of some of those fire breaks. And then, of course, our four-legged employees, the goats that you have. Currently in the city, we have uh, three herds throughout the city. If you want to know where they're at, you can check them out on the goat tracker through the city website. Um, and that's kind of the main ways we address our fire break. Great. And I just want to add, you know, when, when the weather changes and the summer months come and it's 105 degrees and we have, you know, 20 knot winds, this issue becomes very important. And it just, you know, really highlights the importance of the abatement program we do to minimize the impacts of fire in, in the, the fire season months. So with that, we're happy to take any questions or uh, open the public hearing. Thank you very much. So I open the public hearing and then we'll take questions um, of the council. Are there any questions of staff from our, my colleagues? Could you just remind us of the deadline for all the abatement to be completed? So uh, the deadline is, is generally, we like to say July 1st, because we want all of those pieces uh, uh, cleaned up before the 4th of July holiday and, you know, the fireworks that are uh, permitted within the city, the safe and sane fireworks and also the public shoot. So it's really important for July 1st when the weather change, we get real busy and we want to make sure uh, to minimize the impact of some of those parcels that have weeds. So we will be uh, really working hard over the next two weeks to finish that up. But we're, we've, we're in a very good position, as uh, Eric noted. Any other questions of staff? I'm really glad we have you that you do this. I want to encourage our, our residents too, um, if they, without being the large parcels, but there's so much dry grass and tall grass that, you know, look behind your back fence and, and realize that maybe you might have a lot of grass and if it ever catches fire, that uh, old dry fence of yours is going to go up, maybe with your house or your neighbor's house. And this is, uh, I'm, you know, I'm glad what you're doing, but I, and I'm glad you're here with us and saying this, so that if you're at home and you know thinking that that's the only thing we're worried about, we're worried about everybody's <laughs> weeds, uh, because it you see it all over Roseville, and you want to make sure that you know other people are put themselves in and think about it, that they have a lot to do to put their weeds down too. Okay, I, I do have a question. This has come up before, and I think it's important that we understand. Uh, so Roseville has a lot of open space, and then the tall grasses, I don't know, start to grow. Um, what is the policy on um, cutting those down? Because I feel like they, you want them to grow a certain length before you're 
cutting, recutting, going back over and over. Can so can you just explain Absolutely. that? Because I feel like we do hear from residents they want them cut, you know, right when they go to two or three feet. So what's the process? So some of those areas, and, and Eric can correct me, are like riparian open space areas where we do not cut their habitat. Um, what our municipal code and our weed abatement standards say is 30 feet from a combustible structure, be it a building or a fence. That's the fire break that we have to employ. So when you think about those larger pa uh, parcels and those open space areas, that's, you know, kind of habitat. And we don't necessarily go in and clear cut that. And I don't know if Eric wants to add anything to that. No, you hit it. You hit the head on target. So okay. So it's really the, the 30 feet. Correct. The... 30 feet from any combustible structure. So, okay. Mary, you know, a follow up. Um, so this this list includes residential or not, not residential. So we only send out to all of our vacant um, parcel owners. So a lot that is undeveloped. There is no house. Uh, so maybe a lot of our areas on the west plan um, that you know. That's why I saw Nicole G on there. I saw Conference Center Drive, which uh, you know. Yeah, and so so okay. the issue is sometimes that our letters um, we're getting information from the county, and it's not always the most current information, but we're doing our best to track down that and update it as needed. So the process is you send this in, and they have 30 days to rectify yes. the situation. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions before I open up to public comment? I'll open it up uh, to public comment. Is there anyone here this evening that would like to speak to this item? Okay. Seeing none, I will close public comment. I'll close the public hearing. Council members have any other um, questions or comments before we he hear a motion? Okay, I think we're ready. Thank you. With this, the City Council will consider adopting Resolution Number 22196, ordering the destruction or removal of all weeds, dirt, rubbish, and rank growth in the City of Roseville, and overruling any and all uh, objections thereto. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor by Councilmember Rucucci, followed by a second with council, by Councilmember Alvord. With that, we'll start roll call with Vice Mayor Haldeschelt. Yes. Councilmember Alvord. Yes. Councilmember Mendonca. Yes. Councilmember Rucucci. Yes. And Mayor Bernasconi. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for being here this evening. And I'll open up to one last public comment. Is there anyone here this evening that would like to speak to the council on any item that is not on the agenda? Now would be your time to come forward. Seeing none, I'll close public comment. And uh, does our city manager or city attorney have any comments for this evening? No further reports, Mayor. Nothing for me, thank you. All right, great. Uh, I don't mean great that you don't have any comments. We do like hearing from you, but thank you, I should say. Uh, and uh, any other comments from my colleagues before we wrap up? Maybe just a couple. It's been really um, excitingly busy the last couple weeks um, with... Um, being out in public and seeing activities that we really haven't seen in three years. And we talked about staffing. We, um, here at our budget, we were able to um, see this uh, police swearing in uh, ceremony at Rosal High School in their theater. Uh, there was a swearing in of uh, nine new police officers, and then there was swe swearing in of 13 professional staff and, and also officers that receive promotions and also um, uh, the volunteers, uh, thanking them for the many hours that they volunteered there, either in at uh, the police department or out in the community doing uh, police service. So that was that was nice. Um, um, I had um, Vice Mayor uh, um, Hollershot was there. Um, so was um, uh, Scott Elvert. Um, so it was it was it was nice. So I, some of these I don't want to say because all of us have done it, but it was yeah. that was just so nice to see the families and uh, because the, uh, as they were mentioning, there were other people that were hired in this period of time, but they didn't have family to come. Not not in that kind of service. It was just kind of like, you know welcome aboard you know but and at the best you could do during covid time so i'm glad to see other things i'm also glad that um uh, i attended a boys and girls club here in roseville they had a ribbon cutting and this is uh uh, the first time that Boys and Girls Club has now come to Roseville, and it was it's in um, in an area that um, had um, 
uh, facilities for uh, children, uh, but it outgrew it uh, and started many years ago uh, when the land was um, donated and to where it is now. So um, they're going to have uh, a summer program. It starts, like, thinking about a week for a couple of weeks, and then they'll close down. And then when school starts again, they will have afternoon after school programs. And um, they're calling the uh, center here in Roseville Union Pacific Railroad Clubhouse. So that was kind of, it's very close to the railroad. It's a couple blocks away from um, uh, the depot. And so um, that was pretty apropos. So that was uh, very exciting to see it. When you go in to see it, it's absolutely beautiful. The kids are going to have a, a, a very nice Nice place to uh, play, um, do homework, and just enjoy themselves. And just one more, I'd say um, there was also an Eagle Scout here uh, ceremony about a week ago, and this young man, uh, it was very interesting because his father is in the military, his father is also a, a past Eagle Scout, but uh, it's like um, it, for him to get it, he was saying, I, I believe he in, in like 10 years, they moved seven times. So he was moving a lot. And um, he wasn't even uh, in the Scouts until he was 11, and he didn't do the Wee Blows and Cub Scouts. He started as an older kid. And um, how he was able to complete all the all the different steps that you need to do. And his project was at Rosal High School. So it was, it was interesting to see, you know, if you really want to do it, you really can, and with a lot of help with their communities and where they, st where areas they stayed. And it really helped him to do this. And, um, and it was, it was fun to see that. And um, uh, we had um, uh, Kevin Kiley there giving him uh, an award for you know his achievement as well as uh, they had me say a few words for uh, the city council of of being there and very honor this young man um, in his in his journey. That's it. Thank you. Just one real quick comment. Um, I've noticed over the past couple months that uh, there's been an increase in various um, neighborhood and incident. Um, Facebook pages, active incident pages and things. And I just want to remind our residents that our city website is a great resource for items. We just uh, did an overhaul of that not too long ago. But also our police, our fire, our utilities, uh, they have their own Facebook pages. And any active incidents or things that are going on, they always post incident updates uh, on those Facebook pages. And it's also linked to our website. So um, I've gone on several of these pages, and you know, most of this information is not right. These are a lot of opinions, and you know, they're not factual. And I, and I just want to remind our residents that if you, you know, are concerned about something like a power outage or concerned about something that's going on in the city, um, we do have our own Facebook pages for individual departments, and our website um, has contact information and, and uh, things about uh, what's happening and you know, factual information from our, our uh uh, people who are actually knowledgeable about what's going on because we're doing that work here in the city. So I would encourage if, if you're looking for that information to, to uh, uh, like our Facebook pages, follow us, uh, or go right to the city website, and there's links uh, to the various departments if you're looking for certain information. But, um, you know, I think it's important everybody has factual information, you know, and that we don't spread misinformation. So um, I think the city does a really good job, and we've worked really hard. Our departments have worked really hard to make sure that the information is updated and that we update uh, the public um, as quickly and as often as possible on, on various events from power outages and other things in the city. So I just want to remind our, our residents that we do have that and we do have our official pages and, and would direct them to that if they're looking for information instead of mining through other um, non-city related pages that might not be their correct information. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, summer solstice, June 20th, Father's Day, June 19th, uh, a lot of transportation. I was on the Capital Quarter Joint Powers Authority meeting today. I'll be in a SACOG meeting on transportation issues tomorrow on behalf of the mayor. Uh, next week is Placer County Transportation Planning Agency. Uh, what day did I see? It? See the 21st or the 22nd? Tacos with a cop at Weber Park. Um, <coughs> did I mention Green Acres is really under, it's blooming right there um, off of Galilee. And then um, on June 25th, uh, we're going to have a rededication of the 
Boljan playground equipment, and it's a real, really uh, uplifting story of a of a community that came together and worked with the city, uh, and the city being responsive to their needs. And then tomorrow, I'm talking to Rotary about drought. So thanks. Mm, good stuff. Mm. All right, Councilmember Alvord. Well, downtown Tuesday nights is back. If you uh, we missed it for a few years because of COVID, but I hear it has been great. I will be there next Tuesday. Um, every Tuesday night for, I think it's through June and July. And I encourage you to go. They've got great bands, lots of very interesting vendors. The, the stores are all open on Vernon Street. And uh, I've heard some really good feedback that it's been really good. They came back with and the great, a great kids playground area, and lots of things to do for children. Early June, I attended the Sacramento Host Breakfast, which is an event that happens, um, hasn't happened in a few years, but normally happens every year. And it's pretty much people from all over the state come to Sacramento and we talk about state stuff. And uh, Eleni, our lieutenant governor, was one of the keynote speakers. And we had uh, the California Chamber of Commerce there. But it was just, it was kind of uplifting. Uh, you know, California's got its issues, but it's still a great place to live. And there's a lot of really good stories still, a lot of neat economic stories. I mean, we live here for a reason. And, and so I kind of walked out of there feeling pretty proud um, just you know, a good reminder of some of the good things that are happening in our state. And they kind of uh, go hand in hand, the uh, GSEC, the Greater Sacramento Economic Council, they had a board retreat, which is basically just an all-day meeting down in Sacramento. But it was another very uplifting story talking about the Sacramento region, which includes us. And the benefit of, um, you know, we've got excellent housing, we've got excellent education. The quality of life around here is fantastic compared to many places in the United States. And, and they were just talking about some of the big economic uh, wins that we've had, some great businesses that have come here, that have expanded here, and the potential of bringing more. And, and so I, really, I very much enjoyed listening to the stories of, of some of the really big businesses and why they came here to the area and those that are just starting to explode and really grow. Um, and again, we've got a lot to be proud of. Tonight, uh, a few of us went to the Raley's One. Uh, it was kind of a preview tomorrow morning. 9.30 is the big opening. It's at the corner of Fitiment and Blue Oaks in Western. It's the first uh, grocery store in Western Roseville, uh, the real Western <laughs> part of Roseville out in the, the boonies. Yeah. The Western edge. So now we, got our, we, now we have a grocery store. But the Raley's One's a really cool, cool concept. I encourage you to go check it out. There's only four or five of them, and it, it's very health-oriented, all kinds of, I mean, just wonderful um, offerings they have there. I'm drinking my um, Drink Coffee, Do Stuff coffee. That's the name of this thing. It's, it's a mild, it's, it's great. It's just everything in there is pretty cool. So I encourage you to go check it out, celebrate with the community tomorrow, 930. And that's all I have. Is it 930 or is it 9 o'clock? I thought it it's was 930 for the general public. I think it's 9. No, nine's the ribbon. 930 for the general public, 9 okay. for the ribbon. They're not, they're not cutting a ribbon, though. Yeah, we'll be there. We'll be there tomorrow morning. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to be there. Uh, just a few things, uh, maybe three things to share. I was invited last week to go speak to the Sacramento leadership um, through the Metro Chamber, and they their program is just getting underway. And there was um, representation from Elk Grove, uh, Folsom, Citrus Heights, and a couple other. I bet I was the only one from Placer County, and just got to meet with them. It's much like the leadership program that our chamber puts together. Uh, those graduates from the Roseville Chamber leadership will graduate tomorrow evening. And so if you haven't already made reservations or you can get out there and at least say hi to them, uh, it'll be uh, 6.30 at Sierra View. And I'll be speaking to the graduates there and encouraging them to get involved and join a board or commission and commend them on the commitment that they've made. And I mentioned it briefly, but uh, yesterday, uh, last night, was the first ever Flag Day uh event that Sun City put together last last night. It was attended by hundreds of their um, residents. And just really interesting, the patriotism and uh, as they went through the flag that all the different iterations of the flag, they handed everyone a small flag and as they um, knew states were entered into the union and they named off those states, they asked everybody to raise their flag or wave their flag if they had lived in that state. So uh, mm -hmm. 
every state was covered. It was it was really um, a nice event. They had never done it before, and as as we know, the gatherings are just the big group gatherings are just starting to happen again. And uh, Bruce did mention uh, a park dedication. We have another one coming that same Saturday, yep. but I'm at a loss for which one it is. Hey, isn't it Hayden? Is it North Hayden? Hayden. North Hayden. Hayden. Okay, yeah. so we've got a couple more park dedications coming. And then for our residents, you can't miss our downtown parade on the 4th of July. So I know we'll probably all be there for that. So on that note, I would um, like to adjourn the meeting and just remind those uh, watching. We we've, already we've already done public comment. Sorry. Public comment. Well, I was going to talk to the, county, the city council about that because there was no, I tried to sign on. At the beginning, there was no way to register for this meeting after it started at all. And I was listening well, we to the park before that park. We don't have a virtual. We don't do that. We don't have a virtual we platform, do sir. So our next meeting is July 6th at 6 p.m. And I uh, hope you all have a safe uh, 4th of July. Thank you very much.